want to say welcome to all our visitors. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Hope that you will stay for our Bible class and then stay uh, after that so we can visit with you and get to know you a little bit better. There's a few things uh, that are new that you can pick up next to the door. We have a new uh, Banner of Truth magazine. Be sure and pick that up. Some very good articles in that. It has about 16 pages of, of good information in that. Also, uh, the report that we get from Johnny Robertson, we support his work up in the Virginia area and North Carolina. That news report is in the foyer next to the door. So be sure and pick this up. And a little bit later on, we will make some DVDs available to you concerning the uh, television program that we support him in as he is preaching the truth in that area and challenging denominational error. So uh, we want to continue to uh, pray for Johnny Robinson, um, Mike Demry, and the others that we support in spreading the gospel. And we need to not only support them with our money, but we need to support them with our prayers as well. I want to remind everyone also that we are going through the process this month of selecting an eldership for this congregation. This is a selection. It's not an election. We're not voting on who will be elders. We're selecting men who are qualified to be elders. And so I've received a few slips of paper that are placed in that box next to the door. Uh, Be sure if you think that there are at least two or more men that can be elders, according to the study that we did, 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, write those names down and put it in the box. And at the end of the month, we will call out those names of those men, and then we'll go through a process by which these men will be uh, spoken to uh, concerning whether there's any objections or affirmation concerning whether they are qualified or not. We are not rushing this process because that gets a congregation in trouble. We want to do things biblically, and sometimes that takes time and careful contemplation and careful study of God's Word. We want to have an eldership in the congregation, but we don't want to take any shortcuts in doing that. We want to do it God's way. Therefore, it's important for us to do this in a manner that is orderly, in a manner that is pleasing in the sight of God. Again, this is not a vote. This is a selection of men who already have those qualifications. This morning I want to ask you a question. Are you in the Spirit? Are you in the Spirit this morning? Hopefully you will answer that question, yes. Have you been in the Spirit this past week? Again, hopefully, you will answer that question, yes. Have you been in the Spirit since you were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Hopefully, you will answer that question, yes. The phrase, in the Spirit, appears 25 times in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. A total of 25 times. In some of those instances, it's referring to the human spirit, in the spirit, referring to the human soul. In other instances, it's referring to something miraculous, whether it be the miraculous powers that the apostles and the first century Christians had, and it will say that they were in the spirit in a miraculous sense. But in the other instances, it's referring to something that should be common to every Christian of every age since the first century. I want to talk about being in the Spirit. There are many misconceptions concerning that phrase. There are many people today, this very day, perhaps this very hour, who think that they're in the Spirit in what they're doing in their religious activities, but in reality, they're not. They will claim, they will tell you that they are in the Spirit, but when you look at what they do, And when you look at what they teach, they're not really in the Spirit. So just making the claim, yes, I am in the Spirit, does not make it so. The Holy Spirit is one of the persons of the Godhead. In Matthew chapter 28 at verse 19, the Great Commission tells us that the disciples were to be baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
There is one God, and there are three persons of that one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when we're talking about being in the Spirit, we're talking about being in the Holy Spirit. We're going to see how that applies to us as Christians today. We know that the miraculous age is not occurring today. God in the Spirit is not performing miracles through anyone in any place of the world. That ended 2,000 years ago with the completion of written revelation. There's no new message to be given. Jude verse 3 makes it very clear that the faith, the faith, was once for all delivered to the saints. That phrase means once for all, never to be repeated. It's given. And therefore, those who claim miraculous activity today must claim that there's additional revelation. And therefore, they'd have to say the Bible is wrong. Now, they don't understand the conclusion of that, but that is the fact of the matter. If miracles occur today... As the Bible defines miracles, then there has to be new revelation because they're two, two sides of the same coin. Now, this is not a study on, the, on how that the, the miraculous spiritual gifts or the miracles of the first century have ended. That's for another time. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13 deals with that, that when the complete revelation has come, that which is in part the spiritual gifts and the miracles, they would be done away they would pass away so we're not talking about miracles we're not talking about people who claim to be in the spirit who go into convulsions we're not talking about what you see on television people who babble a bunch of stuff and call it speaking in tongues we're not talking about what you see in a pentecostal and charismatic denominations and where people will fall on the ground roll around on the ground have running fits and just act completely crazy and say they are in the Spirit. Again, when you read what the Bible says concerning what it means to be in the Spirit, that's the very opposite of being in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit and His relationship to the faithful Christians. In fact, when you read the entire chapter of Romans 8, you find that all three persons of the Godhead are mentioned concerning their relationship to the faithful Christians. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all mentioned in Romans chapter 8 in the roles that they play in the continual sanctification of the faithful child of God. But I want to zero in on Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, and then we'll go from there concerning our subject of being in the Spirit. Romans 8 and verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Now, in the context here of Romans 8, Paul is contrasting the mindset of the world being in the flesh with the mindset of being a faithful child of God, and that's being in the Spirit. And he goes up in verse 5 and says, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The people of the world, they're engaged in the things of the flesh. They do what they want. That's what that means. They do what makes them feel good. And so they live in the flesh. But those who are belonging to Christ, those who are Christians, they are to live according to the things of the Spirit. Verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death. That leads to spiritual separation from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So to be spiritually minded is to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Because the carnal mind is at enmity or hostile against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're in the flesh, you're in the world, you cannot please God. Therefore, that's why we preach the gospel. To get people out of the world and into Christ. And when you're in Christ you'll be in the Spirit. And notice also, verse 9, but as he's writing to the Christians at Rome, you are not in the flesh. Well, they had fleshly bodies, but he says you're not in the world anymore. But you're in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. 
Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. In the Spirit, one commentator says this about it. That is, you are spiritually minded. You are under the direction and influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to notice the connection between being in the Spirit and the Spirit of God in us. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, then you are in the Spirit. And if you're in the Spirit, then the Spirit of God dwells in you. Let me show you when that happens. Turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the day the church began. Those who had killed the Son of God were told to do this, to be saved. Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be immersed, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. What will be the result? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when a person repents... They're confessing Christ. They believe in Christ, of course. They, they, make, they make that faith known by their confession. They repent of their sins. They're immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ. That's by His authority. For the forgiveness of sins in obedience to the plan of salvation, the blood of Christ removes their sins. They are saved. And notice verse 38. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to see a parallel passage to Acts 2.38. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is giving instructions concerning the Holy Spirit. And I want you to notice what he says here in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. Now that is parallel to Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 and 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 are further explanations of one another. The Bible is its own best commentary. And so we see Paul here, by inspiration, explaining what happens when you're immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. It's by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us the gospel, and it's God's power to save, Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. So by the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit that's found in the Word of God, the Scriptures, he says to the Corinthians, you were all immersed into one body, baptized, immersed in water into one body. Baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38 and Acts 2 and verse 47 added to the church. Into one body, added to the church. Those are parallel. And it says it doesn't matter your your ethnic background, the Jews are Greek, slave or free, economic status doesn't matter to God. And notice the last part of that phrase, all were made to drink of one spirit. Drink of one spirit. What happens when you drink something? You take it into your body. Now, we don't literally drink the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit isn't literal liquid. He's using metaphoric language here. But the point is that when you're baptized into one body, baptized for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're made to drink of one spirit. Take in. Therefore, we know this to be the case that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us very clearly, and we know that based on faith, not on feeling, not on some experience, but based on what the Bible tells us. Now, I wanted to set that stage because this is important for us because that's where it begins. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, Paul says then you are in the Spirit. We're in the body, in Christ, in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in us. That's relationship language. We enter into a relationship with God in the body of Christ. 
which is the family of God. Now, back to the concept of being in the Spirit. As we see here in Romans chapter 8, verses 4 through 9, there is no compatibility between being in the flesh and being in the Spirit. He says, you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And we know the Holy Spirit communicates with us, and He does so through the sword, through the Word of God, through the message, the Scriptures, This is His means of communication to us today. And therefore, when we believe and obey and submit to His will, we are in the Spirit. And the Spirit is in us. So we see here from this passage, how can I know that I'm in the Spirit? First thing we see from Romans chapter 8 is, we're not in the flesh. We're not pandering to our flesh Our main concern, our main goal is, what does God want me to do? If that is your mindset and you're saying, I'm willing to do whatever the Bible tells me to do to be a faithful Christian and live for Him and make the sacrifices that are necessary and put out the effort and the dedication that God wants, then you're in the Spirit. But if you have the attitude, well, I'll I'll serve God to the point in which I'm comfortable. I'm not going to step out of my comfort zone because I don't want to make any sacrifices. I want a convenient religion. Then you're not in the Spirit because that's still in the flesh. You're still thinking as the world does. They want a religion that panders to them. So if your mind is set upon the Spirit, the Spirit's will to do the will of God and to live according to the Holy Spirit's message found in the Bible, then indeed you are in the Spirit. Let's look at another passage, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Another way that we can know that we're in the Spirit is our worship. Our worship. Philippians 3, verse 2 and 3. This is one of the most positive books that you'll find in the Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice is found throughout the book. But Paul does say some pretty strong things here about false teachers. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, he said, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus And have no confidence in the flesh. Now notice what he says here. In the midst of a very positive book about rejoicing, he says, beware of dogs. Now we've all seen the signs. Some of you might have the signs on your your fence. Beware of dogs. Or beware of dog. Well, of course, Paul here is not referring to a literal dog. He's using this metaphorically. And he's calling false teachers dogs. And the specific false teachers he's talking about are those who are of the mutilation. Those were the Judaizing teachers who were binding circumcision on everyone as a part of the gospel. He says those people are dogs. That's pretty strong language. I would doubt the Apostle Paul would find a place in many churches of Christ to preach nowadays. Because this is politically incorrect. But he called these false teachers dogs. Beware of dogs. They're evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. They're mutilating the flesh. They're not really doing God's will when they're binding circumcision. They're mutilating the flesh. And notice what he says in verse 3. For we are the circumcision. Colossians 2 verse 11 and 12 says, There is a spiritual circumcision that takes place when a person is baptized. Not a literal one but a spiritual circumcision, the cutting off of the flesh out of a person's life. And it's for male and female. That spiritual circumcision takes place. So Paul says, we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Worship God in the Spirit. Now, worshiping God in the Spirit means we worship God in spirit and in truth. In John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, as Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, He said, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. 
And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. So we see here as Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman that we must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, the in spirit part here in Jesus' words is referring to the human spirit. It's not referring to the Holy Spirit. It's referring to our worship must come from our spirits. It must come from our minds. It must be sincere. It must come from our innermost person and expressed in truth. Correct action. It's not enough just to worship sincerely. We must worship sincerely according to God's will. That's why spirit and truth are put together in Jesus' message in John 4, verse 23 and 24. So those who worship according to truth are worshiping in the spirit because it's the spirit who gave us the truth. In John 17 and verse 17, Jesus prayed, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So the Holy Spirit who gave us The Word, the Scriptures, is the one who's instructing us on how to worship Him. And so when we sincerely worship God according to His will, we're in the Spirit. We are in the Spirit. We worship God in the Spirit when we do that. And Ephesians chapter 5 talks about that a little bit. Ephesians 5 verses 18 through 21. Paul says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So the question this morning is this, as we sang these songs of praise together, are you doing it in spirit and in truth? Are we just singing because that's just what we do? It's just our habit? Or are we listening to the message that we're singing? Are we making practical application to our life concerning the message that we are singing? If we are singing in spirit and in truth, that we then we are worshiping God in the spirit. Because that's what the spirit has instructed. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. There are those who are worshiping today who are doing things that the spirit has not instructed concerning worship. There are many people who believe that in the Spirit they are okay to worship God with instrumental music. But there is no authority for that in the New Testament. They have no authority from Jesus Christ who gave us His Word through the Holy Spirit to worship God with any instrument. Therefore, they're not in the Spirit when they worship God. And their worship is vain, according to Matthew chapter 15. Because when we follow the traditions and the commandments of men, then that makes worship vain. It makes worship useless. So those who are doing things contrary to the will of God in worship, then they are not worshiping God in the Spirit. Some of those who claim to be worshiping God in the Spirit this morning will not take the Lord's Supper this morning. Or today at all. They might do it once a month. They might do it once a quarter. That's not in the Spirit. Because we have the Spirit giving us instructions that we are to follow the traditions. We're to follow what's laid down in the New Testament. And Acts 20 and verse 7 says they met upon the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1 and 2 says they did it every first day of the week. Therefore... The disciples met together according to the words of the Holy Spirit upon the first day of the week to break bread. So those who claim to be in the Spirit today who are not taking the Lord's Supper every first day of the week according to the Holy Spirit's pattern, they're not in the Spirit. They might say they are, but making that claim does not make it so. And many other examples can be given concerning this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. As we look at another aspect of worship, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. We know that we're in the Spirit if we're worshiping God in the Spirit, if we're worshiping according to the Holy Spirit's instructions. And part of that instruction is prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, we see here that the Christian is to put put on the whole armor of God. I appreciate that song that was led Uh, soldiers of Christ arise. We need to be reminded that we are soldiers. 
and that we need to put the armor of God on. And part of that armor is communication with the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that's His instrument, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You've got to have communication on the battlefield. God has already communicated to us. We have everything we need right here. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. There's not going to be any additional messages. This is all we need. And therefore, we have instructions. We see the battle plan laid out right there. But we pray to the Father so that He might help us and be with us in providence as we fight the spiritual warfare that is there. And part of that worship that we not only do here, but we do in our private life is prayer. Prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In the Spirit, again, means according to the instructions. Are you a person of prayer? Do you pray every day, several times a day, with sincerity in your heart, praying in spirit and in truth? If that is the case, then you're praying in the Spirit. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So there should not be any area of our life in which we do not take this before the Father. Praying in the Spirit means we have to pray according to what God has instructed. We pray to the Father through Jesus Christ. We're not praying to Jesus. Again, there are many people today who claim to be in the Spirit this very morning who are praying to Jesus. That's not biblical. We pray through Jesus to the Father. Christ is our mediator. He is our high priest. He is our go-between. But we address the Father in prayer through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Again, there are many people who claim to be in the Spirit today who are praying to Mary or praying to some saint or praying to some statue. Again, That is simply idolatry. That's contrary to the will of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do you rejoice always? Do you pray without ceasing? When a person stops praying, they give up hope. They give up hope. And therefore, if you're praying without ceasing and in everything you're giving thanks, then you are praying in the Spirit. We have to understand there are some qualifiers. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. Here are the qualifications for proper prayer. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, uh, excuse me, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, We have confidence towards God. How can you have confidence that your prayers are heard? Verse 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. That's how we know that our prayers are heard. That's how we have confidence. Because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. If you're doing that, then whatever we ask from Him will be in harmony with His will and we will be praying in the Spirit. Finally, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And this kind of goes full circle back to the contrast between being in the Spirit and being in the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, we have contrast the Spirit and the flesh And the danger of walking in the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 through 21. uh, Paul says, but I say walk in the spirit. Live in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these things are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Talking about the law of Moses. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, 
fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you before, just as I said to you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul here, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives a category list of sins that will send the person to hell. And he's writing to Christians. So there is a danger that a Christian can stop walking in the Spirit and start walking in the flesh. If not, then why would he give this warning to Christians? And we see here that the works of the flesh are evident. This is what the world is all about. You see this in in the world. You see adultery. You see fornication, sexual sin. You see uncleanness and lewdness. You you see idolatry. You see sorcery, hatred. You see contention and jealousy, outbursts of wrath. You see selfish ambition, dissension. You see heresy, which is false teaching. You see envy, murders, and drunkenness, and revelries, which that word just simply means partying. The nightclub scene. That's what that's talking about, revelries. Pandering to the flesh. Things like will keep a person out of heaven. A Christian should not be involved in those things in any shape, form, or fashion. Look at verse 22. Word of contrast. But, word of contrast. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who are in the Spirit, who are walking according to the commandments, who are living according to God's will, they're producing the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And we see here those qualities of joy, rejoicing in the Lord, having a positive disposition. And you have love there, which you even love your enemies. You have peace, peace with people, peace with God. You have long-suffering You're willing to bear along with people. You have kindness towards people, even your enemies. You have goodness in your heart and in your life. You have faithfulness. You're faithful to God. You're you're faithful to your spouse. You're faithful in every area of your life. You're gentle. We are out to harm no one. We're out to help everyone. We're to have self-control. That means we control ourselves. That's the very opposite of living in the flesh. In the flesh, you do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. But self-control is part of the Spirit's work. And those who are Christ who have crucified the flesh and the passions and desires, for if we live in the Spirit, we also walk. Let us also walk in the Spirit. So the question again this morning is this. Are you walking in the flesh and in the Spirit? If you're walking in the Spirit, you're producing these qualities of the fruit of the Spirit in your life, then yes, you are in the Spirit. But if you're engaged in the things of the world, remember what Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot live in adultery and think that coming to worship service is going to make it okay. You cannot engage in the use of alcohol and other drugs, whether it be nicotine, and think that it's going to be okay in the sight of God. Cannot do it. That's trying to hold on to the Spirit with one hand and the world with another. We have to be careful, brethren, that we don't try to justify our behavior and think that attending church service will make it right. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. I want to end with this verse here. Galatians 3, verses 1 through 4. Notice what Paul says to the Galatians who were being tricked by false teachers. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you or tricked you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? 
Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Now notice he is rebuking the Galatians. He said in chapter 1, he marveled that they're so soon turned away from the gospel to another gospel, which isn't a gospel, it's false. A false gospel that the Judaizing teachers were teaching. And he says, you're foolish Galatians here. Who has tricked you or bewitched you from obeying the truth? They had stopped obeying the truth and they went into the fleshly religion of Judaism. Now that can apply to false religion, but it can also apply to any of the works of the flesh. Going back into the flesh. And he asked them a question. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, it wasn't by the law of Moses. It was by the hearing of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. They heard, obeyed the gospel, and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 and verse 38. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that's when they were converted, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? The answer is no. You cannot begin in the Spirit and then end in the flesh. Because as Paul said in Romans chapter 8, to be in the flesh is that enmity with God. That's hostility towards God. Are you in the Spirit this morning or are you in the flesh? Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. Perhaps there's someone this morning who began in the Spirit years ago, but now you're in the flesh. You're not living as you ought. You're you're engaged in some aspect of the work of the flesh. God in His grace and mercy through this message that you find in the Bible is calling you to repentance, to confess your sins and to come back to Him in which He will graciously forgive you. Perhaps you're not in the Spirit at all. You might be religious, but you're not in the Spirit. Believe in Christ, confess that He is the Son of God, Repent of all your sins and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and you will be in the Spirit. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and sing.